Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hold. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, They Defiled Themselves. For the last several weeks, we've been talking about and referring to self-discipline, self-control, and the importance of maintaining a right standing or a right relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And today, I want to continue along that same line of thought with our message entitled, They Defiled Themselves. So please, turn with me to our scripture found in the Psalm, Psalms 106, and we're going to read just one verse, verse 39. We're going to use the NLT, the New Living Translation. So Psalms 106, verse 39, it reads, they defile themselves by their evil deeds, and their love of idols was adultery in the Lord's sight. The scripture did not beat around the bush. It did not miss words. It comes right up and says it. They defiled themselves. It was not that they were tripped up or that they were deceived and going that way. It was not that someone tricked them or that they had no idea what was going on. It was not even that they were innocent in all of this, but rather God said that they had defiled themselves. There was no one else to blame. They could lay that blame at no one else's feet except their own, because it was they themselves who had knowingly defiled their own souls with evil deeds. It was their own actions that defiled them, not somebody else's, but their very own. And it is the same with us today. We defile our own selves with our own actions and with our own words. Yet, we consider ourselves innocent. It's not our fault, we say. I'm innocent in all of this. In today's society, no one wants to take responsibility for his or her actions. And our government and social media, they encourage this type of behavior, this type of thought. It's not your fault. You had a hard life. It's not your fault. You were mistreated as a child. It's not your fault. It's your parents' fault. It's not your fault. You, 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 your childhood was a difficult one. It's not your fault. You were born that way. It's not their fault. They're just acting up because they've been held down for so long. It's not their fault. They're victims in all of this. They're the victims. But the scripture says that they did it themselves. They had defiled their own selves by their evil deeds. There was no one to blame. It's their own fault. They had to take their own responsibility. It's not someone else's fault for you defiling yourself. Everyone has the responsibility to acknowledge his or her own deeds. Nobody else can take responsibility for you. You must accept your own responsibility. The psalmist said this, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. It gives God no pleasure in punishing the guilty. He wants everyone to recognize and accept their own wrongdoing and to repent and turn away from their evil deeds and turn to Him and He will forgive them. Look at what God said in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. Only acknowledge your guilt that you rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among foreigners under every green tree and that you have not Obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am your master. We must acknowledge our own wrongdoings. And if we do acknowledge our own guilt and confess that we have rebelled against the Lord our God and that we have placed things, stuff above Him and not obeyed His word, not obeyed His commandments, and if we will only turn to Him with a repentant heart, He will forgive us because He's a good, good Father. 
if it could be said that God had a weakness, and he does not have a weakness, there's no weakness found in him, but if it could be said, if God did have a weakness, it would be this, it would be his great love and mercy towards his creation, mankind. For God is a merciful God towards us. He's a loving and kind God towards us. God loves us so much that he's willing to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive again. But make no mistake, God is also a God of vengeance and a God of justice. He will not leave the guilty unpunished, nor will he let lawbreakers go free. The Proverbs says this, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 21. Be assured an evil person will not go unpunished, but the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. So please understand that we are all guilty. We are all transgressors of God's law. But because of his great mercy, he has paid our debt himself for us and has forgiven us by shedding his own blood. He died on the cross to pay a price that he did not owe, a debt that we could not pay. The price was way too high. So Jesus himself got off the throne and went to the cross to die for us. Now he expects us to turn from our evil ways and we are as we should. Even from the very appearance of evil, he wants us to turn from. He did not want us participating in evil things. He paid a price that was way too high for us to continue in our own evil way. Turn, he says, and turn to him. And turn to him with a whole heart. Not a half-hearted heart, but a whole heart. But today's Christian wants to have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. He or she wants to have her cake or his cake and eat it too, so to speak. They want to enjoy the pleasures of sin while reaping the blessings of the Lord. But the scriptures declares this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Paul said we are children of the light. Jesus tells us we are the light of the world. We have no fellowship with darkness because we are light. There is no partnership with Satan or with any of his minions or with any of the tools that he uses like lying and stealing and cheating and cussing and coarse joking and dirty movies and horror flicks. Even Halloween, we don't participate in those things. Nothing that has the appearance of evil shall we partake in. We are to keep ourselves separated from the world and the things of this world, the evil things, and hated even the garments that are stained by sin. Sin is so offensive to God. It is a stench in his nostrils. You cannot have fellowship with God and fellowship with evil. And when you participate in such things, you alienate yourself from the Lord, your Savior, the one who redeemed your life from the pit. Do not let be like the Israelites who defile themselves just for a moment of pleasure. This is a fleeting world. This world is passing away. These things are passing away. The pleasures of sin, they're passing away. They're only here for a season. Eternity is forever. We have to be eternity focused because eternity is forever. See, in eternity, we will either be in a place of perfect peace and harmony and tranquility, or in a place of eternal torment with unquenchable flames and with great anguish. Everlasting torment and the roar of those flames and the screams will be forever. The screams will be ringing in your ear 
forever if you ever go to that place. I know it's not a popular thing to talk about eternal punishment. But whether it is popular or unpopular, there is coming a day when every soul, whether still alive or whether have passed on before, whether they're dead, will have to stand before God of all creation and be judged according to their deeds. So don't let the temporal things disqualify you from the eternal things, the things that will last forever. Like I said, sin is a stench in the nostrils of Almighty God. He cannot look at, nor can he bear with sin. He is much, much, much too holy for that. Yet his people insist on taking him to places he does not want to go. And think about this for a moment. If God will never leave us, nor will he forsake us, then that means that he's ever present with us. He's with us forever. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us. We have received the Holy Spirit from God as a seal of his ownership on us. And he has put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So, if we consider that very carefully, if we think about it, we will see that God is with us at all times. He is omnipresent. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's always, always there. Now, if God is with us at all times, do you feel comfortable? Do you still feel comfortable going to the club with your friends and having Jesus tag along with you? Or do you feel comfortable sitting in an hour and a half movie with profanity, dropping the F-bomb, and using the name of the Lord as a cuss word, use the name of God as a cuss word, and not to mention the nudity and the all kinds of debauchery. Are you comfortable sitting through that type of movie? Do you feel comfortable now take a step further and imagine for a moment, imagine that Jesus is physically there. Imagine him sitting there next to you at your R-rated movie, at your club, doing you telling these coarse jokes or doing fornication. Do you feel that you would still be comfortable with Jesus sitting there, seeing all that you're doing physically, not just spiritually, but physically? I'm sure you would not be willing to do all of that if Jesus was right there physically beside you. Well, Jesus is physically. Though we cannot see him, though we cannot touch him, Jesus is always physically and spiritually with us because he lives in our hearts. It's a concept that's difficult to understand because we can't actually see it. We can't prove it by science. But Jesus is with us at all times. He hears us, sees us, knows what we're doing at all times. I believe that if you knew that Jesus, or if Jesus was right there, you would not do that. If you've truly met the risen Savior, you would feel uncomfortable. It would make you feel dirty. It would make you feel ashamed if you had a true relationship with Jesus. But not only that, Jesus will not subject his presence to that kind of environment. He said that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. But only if we're pursuing holiness, if we're pursuing evil, if we're pursuing the things of the world, his presence is not going to be with us. His spirit will not continually strive with us because of our evil deeds, because of our evil words. So if you want to have a relationship with Jesus, you have to turn from those ways, the ways of the world, the ways that, that, that the world says is the right way. Because there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. So Jesus is not going to subject his presence to that kind of environment. 
Let us look at the rest of that scripture that we started to read early. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Notice that God said he will make his dwelling among them and he will walk among them. So who is the them that the Lord is referring to? It is us, us Christians, the blood-bought, the saints, the redeemed, those who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. It is us the Almighty God wants to dwell with and wants to walk amongst. But we must do something as well. What is that that we must do? Glad you asked. We must come out from among them, meaning we must separate ourselves from the rest of the world. We cannot act like them. We cannot talk like them. We cannot look like them. We, we try so hard to look like the world with all our tats. We are all tatted up these days. Christians are all tatted up. That You, you can't tell one, one Christian from a sinner. I saw a picture uh, of a pastor's daughter on social media just the other day. She had tattooed a snake crawling up her cleavage and tattoos on both sides of her breasts. Why is a young Christian woman tattooing a snake slithering up between her breasts? Your body is not your own. You were purchased at a price. It is not your woman's prerogative to do with it as you please. You are to keep your temple holy. You are to keep it full of the Holy Spirit, not full of graffiti and spray paint all over its walls. Come out from amongst them and do not try to blend in with them, nor try to be a part of them. Being a friend of the world is to be at enmity with God. The world hates God. Society is hostile towards the things of God. Come out from amongst them and be separate. Why are you indulging in these kinds of things? Why are you practicing that type of lifestyle? And while I'm on this, I might as well just say it. Stop dressing like the world as well. Come into church dressed like you're going down to Walmart. There was a time when we used to save our Sunday best for Sunday. We used to take it out to come to worship our Lord and Savior and try to offer Him our best. Why? Because He's worthy of our best. We used to save our best for Sunday as an offering to Jesus. Why are you so upset, Brother Kenny? I'm not upset. I'm passionate about it. Eternity is a long, long time. And you will spend eternity in one place or the other place. The torment and suffering of one place will never ever end. And I know that there's those who tell us that hell is not real. It's hell is not forever. Because if it was forever, that would be too cruel. God would never do that. Jesus was so adamant about coming to this old dusty earth to die a cruel and brutal death in order to purchase our salvation and to buy our forgiveness so that we would not have to spend eternity in that place. Now you're telling me that it was all for nothing? And Jesus didn't know what he was talking about because hell isn't really real. And even if it was, it is not forever. It doesn't last forever. You will eventually pay your debt and come out. You will eventually be freed. Why did Jesus die then on a cross? Why was he whipped to inches of his life? Why was his hands pierced to a rugged cross? His feet nailed to a rugged cross? Why would he endure that? if not to purchase your salvation, if not to purchase my salvation? Why would he die if you can pay for that yourself? Well, all I can say is, 
there's a rude awakening coming for somebody because hell is a real real place and the lake of fire is a real real lake of fire and it burns for all eternity the torment is for all eternity and the souls that are sentenced there is there for all eternity this is your chance this is your opportunity to get it right with Jesus you know hell was not created for man it was created for the devil and his angels but man will choose to go there by rejecting their only Savior the one who actually died for them the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of the living God we can do nothing to earn our own salvation we can do nothing to escape the flames of hell there's nothing nothing absolutely nothing that we can do Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is the gift of God salvation is a free gift offered to you purchased by Jesus' blood purchased by his death and in return Jesus expects loyalty he expects worship and he expects obedience he is a mighty king a mighty warrior and he demands respect he demands honor and he demands fear he demands that we fear him Jesus said we are to fear the one who can both kill the body and destroy the soul in hell fear him who can do that somebody might say I do not want to go to that place you described, Brother Kenny. How can I escape such a horrible end, such a tragic end? Well, I would say, do not defile yourselves with idols. Do not participate in fornication. Keep your soul pure and do those sorts of things. Keep away from, from these things that are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Let me read them for you. Starting at verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor rivalers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul said that some of the Corinthian congregation were participating in it. They, they were doing the same exact things before they got saved. But when they met the Savior, they stopped practicing such behavior. Their whole life changed because they met Jesus. They had an encounter with the Lord. You cannot meet the Savior and not be changed unless you do not accept Him as the Savior. But once you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and accept all his his all sufficient sacrifice your heart will change and you will want to please your lord and savior because you love him because he first loved you i believe it was jonathan edwards who said the religion that does not change you will not save you so in order to escape eternal punishment you must accept jesus as your Lord and Savior and let him change your lifestyle there's no other name under heaven that is given to us by which we must be saved once you accept his free gift of salvation and you believe that he is the Son of God and that he redeemed your life from the pit then you must obey all that he has taught beginning with turning away from your evil deeds and turning to him and living a righteous life. You must also begin to love others, even love your enemies. It's a hard teaching, I know. It's a very hard teaching, but it's a necessary one nonetheless. The biggest sin that we have to deal with today is the sexual sin. And sexual sin is one of the worst sins because Paul said that 
all other sins that we commit, we commit outside the body. But when we sin sexually, we not only sin against God, but we sin against our own bodies. And that's why Paul urges us, flee sexual immorality. We are told to glorify God in our bodies, but we cannot do that. We cannot glorify God if we united our bodies with someone other than our spouse. Living with a girlfriend, living with your boyfriend is wrong. Even if it's your fiance, it is wrong. If it is not your legal spouse, it is wrong. And it will be counted to you as sin. It will be counted to you as transgression. And you cannot serve God in such a relationship. Look, I don't make up the rules. I just follow them. I just proclaim them. I just tell you what the scripture says. I did not make it up. Here's what I'm saying though. Jesus expects you to seek holiness. He expects you to walk in righteousness. He expects you to turn your life from evil to good. He has given us a conscience to help keep us on track. But there's some who ignore the pricking of that conscience. Let me advise you. If you feel a prick in your conscience, something that you said or something that you did, you better heed it. It's the Holy Spirit that's prompting you. Repent and do not do that thing again. Repent and do not say that thing anymore. Do not do, do not say, but trust the Lord Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is coming back real, real soon. So when he's gonna return on that, mounted on that white stallion, he's coming back for the redeemed. He's coming back to get us. And you know what? His rewards are with him. So if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I would suggest that you get to know him. Get to know who he is. Because when we look around and we see the sign of the times, we see with our own eyes what is going on. We know that the time of tribulation is upon us. And right after the tribulation, after the tribulation of those days, the Lord Jesus will come back to get us, his redeemed. The church calls it the rapture. And we'll be taken up. The door will be closed, slammed shut. I know there's those that believe that you're still going to be saved after those days, after the rapture. But let me tell you, don't take that chance. Get it right with Jesus now. Because it'll be like those five virgins, the foolish virgins, who were waiting. And at the midnight cry, it went out. The bridegroom has come. The bridegroom has come. And the five wise virgins, they got up, they trimmed their lamps, and they went in. But the five foolish didn't bring oil. They couldn't trim their, their lamps. So they had to go and buy oil. And when they came back, the door had closed. They had missed it. And they began to knock. Let us in, let us in. It is us, it is us. Let us in. And the bridegroom will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. I don't know who you are. And there they will go utter darkness this is the time this is your opportunity make Jesus your Lord and Savior if you want to know Jesus as Lord and Savior if you want to be assured of living in eternity with him do it today I'm imploring you do it today we don't have a whole lot of time left on this side of eternity if you would like to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, just say this prayer with me. Mean it with your heart. For if we confess with our lips and we believe with our heart, Jesus will hear. He'll forgive and he'll accept us as his children. Repeat this prayer after me. 
Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to turn from my evil deeds that I might not defile myself. Lord, that I might live for you. I say thank you, Jesus, for purchasing salvation for me and offering it to me for free. I accept it now, and I thank you. For it's in your name, Lord Jesus, that I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will, He will help you. He will sustain you. What I want you to do is to go out and buy a Bible if you don't have one. If you have one, take it off the bookshelf. Dust it off. Take it up from, from the storage, wherever you have it. Dust it off. Begin to read it. Read it every single day. You've got to get in the Word. You've got to memorize the Word. You've got to study the Word. You hide it away in your heart. You've got to meditate on the Word. And then I want you to find a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches that embraces the things of the world and thinks that everything is, is okay for us to do. It is not. There's a right way and a wrong way to live. Live the right way. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. So I want to say thank you so much. And I want to remind you that Jesus loves you. We love you. The Lord bless you richly. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.